Good morning, Berean. On the occasion of this sermon honor our graduating high school seniors, I'm going to be using an extended metaphor of sorts. It gives me language and a framework to say all the things that I would love to say to my graduating high school seniors. Um, just by way of a little business, hopefully there was a link somewhere where you can grab my sermon notes and help you follow along with my main ideas. And I've also got the verses that I'm going to be used posted on there. So if you haven't already found those, perhaps you could take a peek for those. So there is an author named Joseph Campbell. He published a book in 1949 called The Hero with a Thousand Faces. And it's a mashup of his love of medieval literature and, and um, mythology and lore from indigenous cultures and various religious faiths and what was then leading edge psychology. Remember, this is 1949. And in it, he describes the archetypal hero of literature. So archetypal meaning it's the original one that's been imitated ever since. And the archetypal hero follows some typical rules and patterns and, and, and is surrounded by typical kinds of friends and false friends and, and enemies and obstacles. And he says all great adventure stories encompass these archetypes. And he has kind of distilled and collated and sorted them for our use and appreciation, a deeper appreciation of, of literature. And, and um, so let me tell you about the typical hero. Typically, the hero receives a call for something more. Neo gets a mysterious message on his computer screen, and, and uh, Harry Potter gets a mysterious letter. Han Solo just knows that he was destined to be a pilot. So typically the hero's hesitant about what this call means because it would disturb the ordering of their world. Also, typically our hero encounters a mentor who helps them along their way, helps them to make sense of this call and, to, and advises them of what their mission might be looking like. Daniel finds Mr. Miyagi and Kirk finds Spock and Edmondante says Abe Faria and Luke meets Yoda. Also you notice that the mentor typically dies. But friends and allies rise up along the way and helps them on their mission. So Frodo is joined by Mary and Pippin and Sam and Luke finds Chewie and Han Solo. Our hero eventually begins their journey, faces obstacles, many trials. I mean, and the trials we understand are necessary to give them the skills and the wit and the intuition necessary to accomplish their final mission, usually along the way facing death. And, um, and then the hero eventually faces their greatest challenge. And it's the reason they left home to begin with. And, and then they win, right? The, the emperor is defeated, the ring is destroyed, genie is freed from the bottle, springtime is returned to Narnia, the snap is reversed, and the universe is saved. And then, victorious, the hero can return home. But usually, forever changed, not quite the same as when they left home. Do you recognize the pattern? You have seen it if you've seen a movie in the last 30 years or so. George Lucas loved Campbell's work and leaned heavily on the archetypes as he created the world of um, of Star Wars and the Wachowski brothers, they wrote the movie The Matrix and they loved Campbell's work so much so that they, they were almost taking it literally. And uh, so here's the point. You are the hero. You are made for more. You are made for a hero's journey of following God. Because following God is what a hero's journey looks like. So I'm the letter to you in the room underneath the stairs. I am Morpheus offering you the red and the blue pill. I am uh, uh, Captain Pike telling Captain Kirk, your father dies so that you could live a less than ordinary life. Don't you feel like you were made for something better, something special? Um, I couldn't have said it better. And it's true. And you are that hero. And you were made for something more. And I would contend it's even biblical. If you look at Ecclesiastes 3.10 and 11, uh, it says, I have seen the business that God has given to the children of man to be busy with. He has made everything beautiful in its time. Also, he has put eternity in a man's heart, yet so that he cannot find out what God has done from beginning to end. What do you make of verse 11, eternity in man's heart? I love that particular verse personally. It, it reminds me of Blaise Pascal, who is a father of computing. He's a Catholic theologian, an early hydraulics engineer. He was a theoretical mathematician. He actually designed and established the first bus line in Paris. He was a busy guy back in the 1600s. And um, his dad was a tax man. And he put young Blaise to work tallying numbers. And Blaise thought, there has to be a better way. And, and so 50 prototypes and three years later, he had the first working mechanical calculator. And 
though you may not have read this particular book, he wrote a book called Pensées. Actually, it's a collection of his thoughts. And, uh, and in it he wrote, There is a God-shaped vacuum in the heart of each man, which cannot be satisfied by any created thing, but only by God the Creator, made known through His Son, Jesus Christ. Again, that was a little fast. There is a God-shaped vacuum, so vacuum in the heart of each man, which cannot be satisfied or filled by any created thing. So nothing you can lay your eyes on, but only by God the Creator, made known through Jesus Christ. So what is eternity in man's heart? Well, it's knowing for one thing that God is out there, and it's knowing that you were made for more. It's knowing that, well, it's a vacuum. Remember, Blaise thought it was in terms of hydraulics. It's a vacuum that only God can fill, though we run into trouble because we try to fill it with all sorts of other things, with, with sports and hobbies and, and music and the media and, and work and books and sometimes with porn and serial relationships and, and uh, money and none of those things satisfy. Only God can fill a God-shaped vacuum. And eternity in man's heart is a way of saying, without God, life doesn't make sense. Nothing else works. You have eternity in your heart because you were made for something more. You were made for a hero's journey of following God. Because a hero's journey is what following God looks like. Let me unpack a little more what that hero's journey looks like. For one thing, heroes will have guides, right? Harry had Ron and Hermione and... Hagrid and Dumbledore and Sirius and others, and to follow God, God will give you at least two guides. He, he gives you God's Word, right? The Holy Spirit indwells us, and then He gives us God, God's Word, and the Holy Spirit helps us understand it. And He gives us the body of Christ. Those are two of the principal ways that we hear from God. Let me unpack that for a little bit. In Proverbs 2, 1 through 6, it reads, My son, if you receive my words and treasure up my commandment within you, making your ear attentive to wisdom, and inclining your heart to understanding. Yes, if you call out for insight and seek it, raise your voice for understanding. If you seek it like silver and search for it as for hidden treasures, then you will understand the fear of the Lord and find the knowledge of God. So it is findable. It is knowable. God's not trying to keep it a secret from us. Verse 6, For the Lord gives wisdom, and from His mouth come wisdom and knowledge and understanding. So God here, personified by wisdom, is calling out to people saying, seek my wisdom, seek God's wisdom. And if you seek it and start to take it in, God will, will he'll, he'll show you a deeper understanding of himself and he will encourage you to start to align your life with how he has designed it to work. So what is this wisdom? Because you might be thinking, well, I'm not really so sure I need Bible wisdom. I haven't been reading my Bible. I've been doing fine myself. In fact, maybe I don't even go to church. And I'm doing life pretty good without all that. And in fact, I'm no more messed up than a lot of people I know. In fact, I've got more in the ball than a lot of uh, God followers I know. I get it. I get it. I've been there myself. Um, okay, there is wisdom. It's kind of like, I think of wisdom like admission control in Houston. Uh, back in the days of the Apollo Project. It's now at the Merritt Island at the uh, Launch Control Center, Kennedy Space Center there. But at Mission Control, we have flight controllers, and they are, they are monitoring a space mission, and they all have their specialties, and they're at their various consoles, and they are monitoring and adjusting and reporting on everything that's happening. And all those individuals report to the flight director who kind of guides the whole thing. And so in that room, it's all the wisdom and the knowledge and the, and the power and the responsibility to guide a space mission. That's wisdom. And that's not the kind of wisdom that we find, that we will find in Scripture. And in fact, that's, God has not designed us for that. Ecclesiastes 3.11 reads that second half, it says, Yet, so that he cannot find out. And we've, he's put eternity in our, heart, our hearts, yet we cannot find out what God has done from beginning to end. God has not designed us for this God-level, eye-in-the-sky, mission-control-level wisdom. The wisdom He has built for us is more like the wisdom we need to operate ourselves. Operate, say, an automobile, uh, by way of illustration. If I'm, if I'm traveling west on I-90 and I need to get off at the Hamilton Street exit and there's somebody in my blind side and there's oncoming traffic on the ramp that it also is right there, I need to get over those lanes and then quickly decelerate as I take the ramp. It's the kind of wisdom you need to know to make the next move. What is the right thing to do in this situation? What is the right thing to do in this situation? That's what God gives us. Not mission control, 
but enough to operate ourselves using the, the guidelines that he gives us from Scripture. So are you seeking God's wisdom? Because the, the time to prepare for the storm is when the skies are blue. It's, he encouraged us to get this wisdom inside us. You might be thinking, well, you know, I'm doing life pretty good myself right now. But the problem is, is that you get older, decisions and crises come at you more and more and, um, and faster. And you will not have time to prepare for them. You will just be slammed into them. So God encourages us, I would encourage you to be getting God's wisdom inside you. Personally, the more life experience I have, the more I realize I do not have it in me to make all the moves that I need to make. But God is there with me and is ready to advise me. There's a paradox in the Christian life where the more spiritually mature a believer becomes, spiritually mature, not physically mature, this can happen at any age, but the more spiritually mature a believer becomes, the more dependent on God they become, not less, right? The more spiritually mature, the more dependent. We, we like to think, oh, I'm going to grow up, I'll, I'll, I, I will go away, and I'll be able to make all my own decisions, and I'm on my own. That's not the way God designed it in the spiritual world. So we know that God guides people, right? He guided the children of Israel out of Egypt with a pillar of cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night. Um, we know God guides. In, in the book of Acts, there's a lot of examples. In Acts 8, God guides Philip out into the wilderness to go and eventually meet the Ethiopian eunuch, the, of, the official from the court of Candace, and then start sending the news down into Africa. In Acts 9, God guided Saul into Damascus after customizing his eyesight a bit. And, and starts getting the guy who's going to write most of the New Testament in place and in position and on his role. God guided Cornelius, the, the centurion of the Italian regiment, a Gentile, to send an embassy down country to Peter and Joppa and invite him to come and tell him about himself. And, and then he guides Peter to accept the embassy, welcome the embassy, and then follow them back up country to talk to Cornelius and start spreading the good news into the Roman world. God's in action. But notice in all these situations, he's just giving the next step to these individuals. It's just, here's the, the next thing to do in this situation. And there's no guarantee or understanding of the big picture. That's the way it is with us. Um, and then consider also, does it make sense that God would design us as physical beings in a physical world and then give us a metaphysical way to guide us that we have to be trying to hear the voice of the Holy Spirit when he has given us a physical map, a physical instruction manual on how to do things. And so, uh, consider also Psalm 119, 105. It's in your notes. Um, psalm 119, 105. And Psalm 119 is cool because it is a psalm that is extolling the virtue of, of the Bible, of God's Word. And it says, Your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. You ever been camping? You know how it is when you're carrying a typical flashlight or lantern and you know, how much does that light up? You know, does it light up the whole campsite or does it light up, the, light up the whole trail? No, typically it's just the next step or maybe two. Your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. That's what it's like following God on a hero's journey. That's the kind of wisdom that he will give you. What's the right thing to do in this situation? So get it inside of us. And the guidance might not look like clear vocational advice. I, I grant you that. It isn't going to be, okay, you go into computers and you go into the reserve and you go into welding and you marry the redhead and you pick the Challenger, not the, not the Honda, right? It, we don't get that. What we do get is what, how we should conduct ourselves, how we should do relationships, what our attitudes and our character and our values should be. Um, and once we read those and take those to heart, that covers a lot. And, and that will be sufficient to guide us a lot, of the, a lot of the decisions that we need to make. What God does give us is rules of thumb for making godly decisions. It reminds me of my youngest, Joey, when he was little. He was a fine little, we got him into soccer, he was a fine little player, but he was a little bit errant. His oldest brother, Drew, could read the, the flow of the game and could just see and intuit where the play was headed. With Joey, I needed to give him more of more situations and more uh, the typical, here's, here's what you do. If you are a right defender and there's an attacker coming down and you've got backup, then push the play this way. But if he has an in, somebody to pass to on the inside, then go this way. 
And so it was just lots of situations, lots of scenarios, um, lots of detail, lots of rules of thumb. But once I gave him those rules of thumb, then he was often as functional as Drew was. The Bible gives us rules of thumb for how to live godly and wisely. Those rules of thumb are divine guidance. The rules of thumb that we find in the scripture are divine guidance for you. And they're guidelines for all our living. And it tells us, be like Jesus here and here and here and in this way and in that way. Pursue faithfulness, righteousness, gentleness, self-control. Honor those you should honor. Obey the authorities. A soft answer turns away wrath. Um, in, in, in all things, give thanks. Don't be anxious. Uh, lots of detail, lots of scenarios, rules of thumb. And uh, you might think, well, my trial, my situation isn't covered in all the rules of thumb. Well, often the approach to the problem is, right? There's often some facet of the problem where we're not, we're not living life in the way that God designed it to be. We're out of His will. And it, would, and it would come to light if only we had eyes to see it and to respond to it, a heart that would respond to it. You know, you won't find support for a same-sex marriage in there. You won't find support for, here's one that everybody seems to miss, sex outside the bounds of marriage, or for an abortion, or for unrighteous business dealings, for disobeying parents, or dishonoring someone in authority. Um, you're not going to find support for those. What about a believer marrying an unbeliever? You know, God has something to say about that. And, and even a believer getting into a business relationship with an unbeliever, that's a hard call. Scripture's got something to say. Are you, what about doing drugs or laziness? Um, God has something to say about providing for yourself and your family. We get hung up on, on alcohol consumption. Well, what about gluttony? Are you eating yourself to an early grave? Um, God's got something to say even about that. You know, but... If you're starving yourself of guidance, if you are not taking in God's word, it's you're going to it's going to be harder for you to accomplish your mission. It's going to be like you're an Apollo 11 astronaut who's turned off mission control. It could be dangerous and a whole lot harder. So God calls us to a journey of following Him and uh, getting to know Him and taking in His word. That's one of the primary ways that He speaks to us through Scripture. The other way that He speaks to us is through the body of Christ through believers who God is indwelling and who God will send your way when you need the help. So have your eyes open to this. God does not come himself when his children need help. Some people will say, oh, you know, I talked to God and, and, and he didn't help. Well, he probably did. So it, it reminds me of the story I, I found recently in Jeremiah 26 that I thought, you know, this is, this is appropriate. The, the prophet Jeremiah, he's telling all the people everything that the Lord has commanded him to say. And all the priests and the false prophets and the people are upset with the words that Jeremiah has been, been saying. In verse 26, chapter 26, verse 8, it says, They seized him and said, You must die. Why do you prophesy in the Lord's name against this house? Then it will be like Shiloh and the city will be desolate and deserted. They didn't like that he was pronouncing judgment against <laughs> Jerusalem and Judah, which were exactly the words that God had told him to say. So Jeremiah said, the Lord sent me to prophesy against this house and this city and all the things you have heard. Now reform your ways and your actions and obey the Lord your God. And the Lord will relent and not bring on the disaster he has pronounced against you. As for me, I'm in your hands. Do with me as you see good and right. But know this, be assured, however, that if you put me to death, you will bring the guilt of innocent blood on yourselves and on this city and on all who live in it. For in truth, the Lord has sent me to speak all these words in your hearing. And the officials and the priests were still like, kill him. And then in verse 17, it says, some of the elders of the land stepped forward and said to the entire assembly of people. And so these are just some, some wise guys, some guys who've been around the block. They've seen a few things and they're recalling history. And they say, well, Micah of Morsheth prophesied in the days of Hezekiah, king of Judah. And he told all the people of Judah, this is what the Lord Almighty says, that Zion will be plowed like a field. The, Jerusalem will become a heap of rubble. The Temple Hill will be overgrown with thickets. Did Hezekiah, king of Judah, or anyone else, put him to death? Did not Hezekiah fear the Lord and seek his favor? And did not the Lord relent so that he did not bring on the disaster he pronounced against them? We were about to bring a terrible disaster on ourselves. It was good advice, and they relented. And notice also that it was advice that 
went against the conventional wisdom, right? The crowd was ready for a lynching, and the priests and the officials and the high-ranking, the bureaucrats and the Hollywood types and the beautiful people and all the betters were saying, Jeremiah's way off base here, because they weren't listening to God and they weren't looking for God. No, they were off base. So God sent the elders, and thankfully the elders carried the day. In a similar way, when you need help, God will send others. So have your eyes open to that. That's part of God's design. Another design, you know, and the Bible tells us that if you've got a tough decision to make, seek out godly counsel. Proverbs 11:14 says, where there is no guidance, a people falls. But in an abundance of counselors, there is safety. Do you have one counselor, two, three people that you could go to? There's safety. There's wisdom. When you have a tough decision to make, a big decision to make, Go talk to godly, some other godly people. Proverbs 12, 15, The way of a fool is right in his own, own eyes, but a wise man listens to advice. Do you think yourself a fool or a wise man? And what's a wise man do? He goes and he gets advice. Proverbs 15, 22, Without counsel plans fail, but with many advisors they succeed. Do you want to succeed? Many advisors will help bring that about. Do you get the drift? We have blind spots that other people may see. And God knows this, and so he has raised up wise counselors for you, other, other people, members of the body of Christ. And it's as if, you know, Jesus doesn't come to give us a hand when we need it, but he wears other people, if you will, as his clothes. In this way, the creator of the universe comes alongside you and says, have you considered this alternative? So let's do a mini recap. In our hero's journey of following God, he sends us guides and mentors. And he speaks to us through scripture and that's a wisdom that kind of gives us the next step in this situation rules of thumb for doing life and then he speaks to us through spirit indwelt believers so the next thing to think about heroes in the great stories face discouragement they face many trials and i need to speak about discouragement because that's a thing even in a journey of following god first peter 1 7 it says these trials will show that your faith is genuine it is being tested as fire tests and purifies gold though your faith is far more precious than mere gold so when your faith remains strong through many trials it will bring you much praise and glory and honor on the day when jesus christ is revealed to the whole world your your faith will bring you praise and glory and honor that's kind of a nice thought if the gold in our wedding rings needs to be heated to melting a, pi a picture of crisis heated so that it can be purified to remove the dross the impurities everything that doesn't belong there doesn't it make sense that our faith would likewise need to be passed through a trial of fire you know, and it and the christian walk it says we'll take you through many trials you see the words many trials in that verse you might circle those or highlight those um, those trials are intentional they are God designed to burn off the dross and build you into the hero you were meant to be. Now in these days of Corona, you've probably noticed that we don't put on much physical muscle by sitting on our couch in our jammies with our cat and our bowl of popcorn and binge watching Netflix. Muscle building doesn't happen that way. Muscle building happens as we lift heavy and we stress our muscles to the point of, of creating little micro tears that then refuse and rebuild. And then more weight lifting, more weight, and more reps, and more micro tears, more rebuilding and refusing. That is called muscle hypertrophy. It is the process actually that God designed for building muscle. And it's why one of the reasons you feel sore after a good workout. Doesn't it make sense that God would have a method of spiritual hypertrophy as well? where? he would put us through trials that would stress our spiritual muscles and that would then refuse and regrow. So heroes in the great stories go through trials so that they can get the skills and the wit and the wisdom and the, and the, and the intuition necessary for their mission. God will put you through many trials. Again, his word says many trials because that's what a hero's journey of following God looks like. You probably remember the scene in The Empire Strikes Back where Yoda is training his wayward Padawan Luke in order to be a, a Jedi Knight so he can defeat the Emperor. And there's a scene where Yoda is riding Luke's back for some reason through a swamp and they come up to this big weird tree and there's a cave underneath and Luke is like, well, there's something wrong with this cave. I, I feel great danger. 
and you would agree he said yeah this is a place where the dark dark side is very strong and it's dangerous and then he says and you must go luke needed to go into and through that hard place in order to become the hero he would become and and i think that's just a picture of the trials that we're going to have to go through there are hard places that we will need to go through in order to become the hero that god is designing us to be in our journey of following him so you get it in your journey of following god there's going to be trials and danger and struggle and that is a good and accurate picture of the christian life often too often we we sell it like, well, you have fire insurance, you won't go to hell, but you'll go to heaven where, where God is and all your friends, and it's a beautiful thing, and Jesus loves you. And we leave out this part in the middle that of many trials and hard stuff. And, uh, and that is an accurate picture. That is what will happen. So expect that. Uh, reframe those trials and think of them as spiritual muscle building, spiritual hypertrophy. That might help. And then there's something else. Joseph Campbell points out that the archetypal hero typically finds that the biggest obstacle facing himself is himself, right? You've seen this. Harry Potter finds out what? He's actually keeping Voldemort alive. And Frodo decides at Mount Doom that, you know what, darn it, I've grown attached to this ring and I don't feel like throwing it into the river of lava right now. And Luke finds out that Darth Vader is, Vader is daddy. Now what is he supposed to do? Hero, the biggest obstacle keeping you from your journey is yourself, right? An unbeliever might tempt you to leave your journey. Heck, you're going to tempt yourself to leave your journey. The thinking is, you know, your life is wasted because you don't get to do all the fun things that I get to do. You've, you know, you have to go to church and read your Bible and you've got all those rules to follow. And that is a way of thinking about it. I used to think that way too before I met Jesus. But here's what happened. Jesus changed my want to and over time, and in a way where I eventually happily yielded my will for his. And I'm still yielding my will, and I will struggle with that all the way home. But more and more, it makes sense. I remember, it reminds me of a conversation that I had with a buddy, Scott Crawford. Seven or eight years ago, Patty and I were considering starting a workout regimen at a local gym um, called Physique. And, and Scott was already going there, and he's, he's strong, he's fit, he's healthy, you know. And... And I was kind of chiding him for having to give up all that good food, and pizza, and burgers, and fries, and tartar sauce, and shakes. And Scotty pretty quickly told me, he's like, I can eat whatever I want. And now Scotty understands nutrition. He knows that it is calories in versus calories burned. And if your calories in is more than the calories you're burning, you'll gain weight. And if your calorie, if you have a calorie deficit, eating less than, than how much you're burning, then you'll lose weight. It's pretty magical that way. But his point was, he happily chose what he ate. He, he chose good food in the proper measure at the right time because he enjoyed the results. And that's a picture of where a mature Christian hero, you, will get to. We'll obey God because we want to, because it brings us joy, bringing him joy, and because we like the results. There's spiritual fitness, spiritual strength even, just remember, you're the biggest obstacle. In you must go. Because you are what will keep you from your journey. So what does it look like on this journey? You know, there's a lot to be done in this world. And God has as many missions as there are people. And at the core, for all of us, it looks like getting to know Him. Getting to know His commands and, and His words, what He what He expects of us, and then starting to align our life with that. It looks like getting to know Him. He's not trying to keep it secret. And, it, and his wisdom is knowable. It looks like, um, it'll look like you will go from a place to where you're not even sure what it means to trust Christ as your Savior to a place where you have a friendly walk with him as he shows you turn by turn, move by move, course correction by course correction on how to walk. You'll, your understanding of how God looks at things will mature and the more and more that you get to know him from the Bible and you'll start to love what he loves and hate what he hates. You'll go from a place to where you're not sure that you even need God in your life to where you'll realize, yeah, life without God doesn't make sense. You'll go from a place of making decisions on your own to having him at your side everywhere you go and him never being far from your thoughts. You were made for this, you and I. That's what it'll look like as you continue to mature in Christ. That's what your journey looks like and is designed to be like. The hero's journey of following God includes as many missions as there are people. 
uh, just kind of got to realize that you may be passionate about something and, and somebody else just doesn't get it. Give them a break because there's so much to be done in this world. And I could go for hours talking about all the possible missions that a Christian could could undertake. And it's not just ministry. It's not we have to become pastors and missionaries. Um, God wants us wherever people are. I, I thought of a couple of examples. There's one that just came to hand, which I thought was kind of appropriate. In 165 AD, so a little while ago, 165 AD, a plague swept Rome. And uh, from the writings, it looks like it was smallpox. It may have had some measles thrown in for fun. And, uh, but the reality is, is that thousands of people died weekly. And before it burned itself out, which took a couple of years, a third of Rome was in the ground. And uh, people would abandon their loved ones in the street because they were infected. The, the emperor even got it. The pagan priests fled the temples because people were flocking to the temples looking for help. Christians were there. And that was the journey they were called to. And they didn't have any greater resistance to smallpox than the rest of the people. But what they did have was water and food and comfort and their faith. And what they had, they shared with the least of their neighbors. Statistically, you were better off, more liable to survive if you knew a Christian than not. They overrode, those Christians overrode their instinct to flee for safety. And instead, they stepped into this journey that God had called them to with no, with no guarantee of the outcome. It was one step at a time, one day at a time. We still need people like this, right? And where's the atheist equivalent of Compassion International and Operation Blessing and Samaritan's Purse? And I think locally of, of um, the Union Gospel Mission, which helps encourage and really establish people getting off the street. And HRC Ministries, which is rescuing girls from sex trafficking and getting them established and on a, on a good road again, the world would be a harsher, less vibrant, less peaceful place without Christians in action. I was just reading Isaiah 10. You know, here's another mission, one that doesn't look like ministry necessarily. Isaiah 10, 1 and 2. It says, What sorrow awaits the unjust judges and those who issue unfair laws? 10, 2. They, this is the rulers, this is the people in power, they deprive the poor of justice and deny the rights of needy among my people. They prey on widows and take advantage of orphans. So here and in other places in the Bible, God is describing his rationale for why he was going to, to bring doom on the land. What was God angry about? Unjust judges and rulers, those who issue unjust laws. God hates it when people are deprived of justice. He hates it when the guilty are set free and when the innocent are incarcerated. Um, when orphans are deprived of their rights, when needy people are deprived of rights. Do you catch the heart of our God here? He's even more sensitive to injustice than we are, and he's watching. We should be terrified when our country puts in place laws that go against God's laws, and uh, when the guilty go free and the innocent are incarcerated. God hates that. We need strong Christians in the political realm, in the legislature, the executive, the judicial branch, and all the supporting infrastructure. We cannot abandon that sphere of influence. We need to consider what it looks like for a Christian to take God's guidelines for us and, and influence politics in that way. Godly men founded our country. They're imperfect, but they were godly, and they did what they could with the tools they had. And we need to carry on their work. We need men and women to carry those principles forward and, and, and politics, but also in wherever people are, right? In industry, in military, in education, in the media, in the arts, wherever people are. The Holy Spirit is calling you on a journey and has given you passions and wiring for a particular mission. You are the hero of your story and the ultimate shape of that mission, God has decreed and already uh, shaped it. And what's cool is that he is going with you you look at Psalm 23, and Psalm 23 tells us about the hero's journey, though you may not have read it that way before. So listen up. Psalm 23, 1 through 3, a psalm of David, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Uh, two things. One, what am I? The Lord is my shepherd. So that makes me a sheep. Nice. And where is the Lord? 
he's leading, right? He's leading me to green pastures beside still waters along paths of righteousness. He's gone ahead of me. Verses 4 and 5. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup runs over. Now where's the Lord? He's walking with you in the valley of the shadow of death. He says, in you must go. And then he gets in there and goes with you at your side. He is at your side preparing your table. He is over you, anointing your head with oil, a picture of comfort and blessing. Verse 6, Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Now where's the Lord? Oh, well, he's following you, right? His goodness and mercy are back there. How often? Is it just when you were going through the hard stuff? It says, no, all the days of my life. He's back there right now. The Lord is going ahead of us. He is with us and over us. He's got our back. We're surrounded. There's nowhere you can go where you are more than a thought away from our Heavenly Father, the Creator. That's a picture of what your mission will look like. You're not alone, ever. Okay, seniors, Lauren, Catherine, Connor, Ben, Caleb, Casey, I love you guys and I will miss you. Here's the sum of it all. You are the hero of your journey. You were made for more, a journey of following God. Because a hero's journey is what following God looks like. This is a call to change your mind if you are not following God with everything that you have. Get on it. This is a call to remember that life without God doesn't make sense. If life stops making sense, it's probably because you're trying to jack something into that God-shaped vacuum that doesn't belong there. So, stop it. Life without God doesn't make sense. Put him back in there. Seek understanding, knowledge, wisdom, insight from your Bibles. It's knowable. It's findable. God has set it there for you to find it. Be connected to other people who are likewise seeking God. God has sent, set out mentors and allies along the way, along the path of your life. So look for them. That's one of the ways God speaks to us. Becoming the heroic God follower takes many trials. Expect many trials. It's Think of it as spiritual muscle building, spiritual hypertrophy. Maybe that will help. Know that you are the biggest obstacle, right? You are what will keep you from your journey of following God ultimately. And you must go. Finally, you have a God-designed mission. Ephesians 2.10 tells us that we are his workmanship. The Bible tells us that we are God's workmanship, God's poem even, his artwork. We are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. God's already gone ahead of us. He's already set everything up. He set out good works for you to do beforehand. Behind the facade of your life, there's a whole lot going on. So have your eyes open to that. Now, before I pray, listener, if you're somebody who's never trusted Christ as your Savior, if you are not positive that when you close your eyes in this world that you will open them in heaven, I've got some good news for you. The Bible tells us that it's written so that we may know that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing, you may have life in his name. The good news is that God loves you, and he created you to have a relationship with him. But it's a relationship we can't have because our sin separates us from God and and will ultimately separate us from him and from everyone we love forever when we leave this world. And God knew that. And he knew that we could not fix ourselves, that we could not make ourselves right with God. And that's why Jesus came, lived a perfect, sinless life, and was our representative, a human representative, to take the price, to pay the penalty for our sin on the cross. All our sins, past, present, and future. And then he rose again. And so now he can come to us and say, okay, I've got a gift of salvation for you. You couldn't make yourself right with God the Father, but I did it. And so all I'm offering is this gift of salvation. All you need to do is to speak to the Father from your heart and from your mind and say, okay, God, I get it. I'm a sinner. I can't fix myself. And you've made a way for me to be right with you. I accept your gift of salvation. Please come into my life. Help me to know and to follow you. And I would encourage you to pray that if you've never trusted Christ as your Savior in this quiet moment right now. Let's pray. Lord, we bring our kids before your throne of grace and mercy. Please preside in a strong way in the lives of our seniors. Please help them to have a thirst for your word and that they would respond to that thirst and that they would become mighty in the scriptures and pass along the good news themselves. 
Please raise up godly friends and spouses to be with them. We become like the people we hang with, Lord, and it would be our desire that they would have a godly crew to do life with. We can't arrange that, but you can. Please help them to be quick, to remember that you, Father, put meaning into life. Use your softening influence to sweetly draw them to yourself when they face trials and challenges. And seniors, I pray that you would always remember that the Lord is with you all the days of your life, just like it reads in the 23rd Psalm, and be comforted by the knowledge that he will bring you home to be with him someday. And we pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, if you've trusted Christ, I would encourage you to find a way to let us know. We'd love to celebrate that with you and pray for you and answer any questions you may have. Now let's get on with our journeys. We say amen at the end of prayers. We say amen at a good point in the sermon. But you know what? It's good to start this next week with an amen. So as we sing this song and we say amen a bunch of times, it's not for the end of the service. It's for starting out this next week. We say amen because it means so be it. We trust that what God has for us this week is in accordance, in accordance with his plan. And he is the one who gives us the strength to bear up under it, the power to endure it, and he has the victory. So we look forward to what God has for us this week, and we say amen.
Amen. And we do not go out alone today. We go out with our Holy Spirit. Let's walk with Him every day. Amen.